Welcome everyone. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people as the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place today, which for me is Meijin, Brisbane. I recognize the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Tobol and Jagura nations. I pay deep respects to the elders past, present and future. Welcome. I'm Camille, the founder of Bloom Impact Investing, and I will be your host today. It is a pleasure to see you all today, both familiar and new faces. Welcome everyone. At Bloom, we are focusing on the impact money can have in the fight against climate change. We are on a mission to make impact investing and sustainable finance easy and accessible. Part of this mission is to offer educational opportunities like these webinars to propel the voices of impact investing and sustainable finance experts far and wide. Since early this year, we have hosted several webinars, talked about climate financial risks, how to measure impact, how to invest with impact during the COVID-19 crisis, impact investing trends, natural capital, and the impact superannuation and sustainable banking can make. If you missed the previous webinars, they are now all available on YouTube. The aim of our webinars is to bring a community of impact investors and agents of change together. This is you. So that we can build a greener, more circular and inclusive economy. At Bloom, we see a world where people don't have to choose between doing well and doing good. This event is supported by Impact Group. Impact aims to bridge the gap between Queensland social innovation and impact investing sectors. Their goal is a thriving impact investment sector that fuels the growth of ventures solving real world problems for future prosperity. What a beautiful mission. Thank you for your support. Quick housekeeping. Please note this webinar is being recorded. The webinar will be made available to the attendees after the event via email and on our YouTube channel. Also, please note the information provided in this webinar will be general in nature only and does not constitute personal financial advice. The information has been prepared without taking into account your personal objectives, financial situation or needs. Before acting on any information from this presentation, you should consider how appropriate the information is in regard to your objectives, financial situation and needs. Finally, please note this is a safe space. So you can ask any questions throughout the event by typing in the chat. Feel free to indicate if you'd like me to ask Lisa or Anna questions on your behalf. We will keep 15 minutes at the end of this webinar for Q and A's. So today we are celebrating. We are celebrating the launch of Impact Queensland Impact Investing Playbook. Congratulations to the Impact team for this great work. And uh, today we are celebrating with two fantastic guests. We have Impact Queensland Chair Lisa Siganto, who will reveal the content of the playbook and the learnings gained by facilitating and securing impact investment for profit for purpose businesses. A little bit about Lisa. I know a lot of you know her already, but for those who don't, let's go. Lisa has worked in the impact economy for almost 20 years, supporting and investing in social entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Through her consultancy, Shorebirds, she has facilitated a number of large scale partnership projects that create social impact. She's the chair of Impact Queensland, White Box Enterprises and Asylum Circle and is a member of Brisbane Angels. So for the entrepreneurs out there, watch out. Lisa was the founding Queensland Director of Social Ventures Australia, where she was responsible for a hub of more than 60 social enterprises and profit for purpose businesses. Formerly, she was a partner in consulting at Deloitte and a management consultant with McKinsey and Company. Lisa has an MBA from Harvard University and an engineering degree honors from the University of Queensland. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lisa. 
Lisa will be joined by co-founder and CEO of Refugee Talent, Anna Robson. Hello, Hannah. Thank you so much for being with us today. We will have a Q&A session with Anna to learn more about her collaboration with Impact, as well as insights into how impact investing was key to the success of her social enterprise. So who is Anna Robson? Let me give you a quick overview of her background. Anna Robson is, like I said, co-founder and CEO of Refugee and Migrant, Migrant Talent. Her experience working on Nauru led her to meet her co-founder, Nirari Dacho, a Syrian refugee with a tech background at a Tech Fuji hackathon in Sydney in 2015. They have built refugee talent together into a successful social enterprise matching refugees with employment opportunities in Australia. They also partner with Talent Beyond Boundaries to bring skilled refugees still displaced in Jordan and Lebanon and move them to Australia and New Zealand matched with a job opportunity prior to arriving filling skills gaps. They have recently expanded into providing another SaaS platform, which is a social inclusion recruitment platform to enable large organizations to hire from many diverse organizations, including indigenous employment providers, disability providers, and refugee organization through a single technology solution. Wow. So today we have really um, a privileged position because we, we will get to hear from both sides of the impact investing equation. Lisa as an investor and Anna as an entrepreneur. So without further ado, um, Lisa and Anna, welcome. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, I will now let um, Lisa dive into the playbook and present to you the great work that she did. Thank you, Camille. It's great to partner with uh, Bloom Investing. Uh, thanks for all those who are attending. Luckily, well, luckily for me, or luckily for you, I can't see you necessarily because I wanted to stand here and, and make sure that people weren't wearing their pyjama pants. This is a new economy, a new way of doing things, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so if you could just put on the chat line whether you are wearing your pyjama pants, I think that'd be really good. Um, it is an exciting time despite COVID, and this is where the bright lights appear. The New York Times wrote last week that investing in social good is finally becoming profitable and that impact investments are outperforming traditional investments with the coronavirus. So that sort of sets the scene of, of what's happening and what the potential is. Uh, as Camille said, I've been leading Impact Queensland for three years, which started off as an idea as most um, profit for purpose ventures do as well, but it's based on this philosophy of that businesses can create social good. So what we're doing is uh, supporting profit for purpose ventures and then uh, developing and growing the amount of investment into those ventures, uh, which is, as I've said, new ground. So part of what we're doing is that we're also launching an impact fund for investment into profit for purpose uh, businesses in February 2021. And we'd like to hear from you before that and we'll be investing in the best impact businesses. Uh, as Camille said, I am also an impact investor and an angel investor. Um, and Asagal, who's on this call, she and I was two of the first investors into refugee talent. And it's an organisation that we love. Asagal's now on the board. And I personally get very excited about the social and environmental problems that businesses are solving. And that's what sort of keeps me going about the, the future potential. Uh, I want to tell you though about why the playbook and, and why we've done it and it really boils down to you know many stories but one story was uh, a friend called John turned up he came about six months ago absolutely fabulous business idea really good business idea he only had three months of personal cash left he had no customers yet and he had no revenues and he wanted us to find a million dollars for him tomorrow and we said, well, actually it doesn't really work that way. 99% of the time it doesn't work that way. And we've had many, many people come to us and ask, you know, well, how do I do this? And the thing is that this is a new area and it's not philanthropy and it's not straight normal venture capital. And there was no handbook. 
So we put this handbook together. Uh, it's called Demystifying the Journey to Impact Investment. It's not totally perfect. We'd love your input and we will do another edition later or somebody will do another edition later, but it's to focus the efforts of the entrepreneurs. It's to reduce your time and it's for you to get the right capital at the right time. So if I can work out this technology, uh, hang on. Okay, right. Um, the big question, this is the hardest slide, it's in the playbook. Um, you will all have access to the playbook at the end of this um, session, which is great, it's free. Um, it's like, well, what is this impact investing? Um, and just back up a step of what we're trying to do with this playbook. We're trying to give you an intro um, so people can pick it up. It's really easy to read. Social Change Central in Sydney have um, done the beautiful formatting. It's something you can you know, take with you and read on the train. Um, you'll get insights really into what the investor expectations are and their motivations. And it's some tips for how to navigate this sector um, through the different, you know, the, the very different levels. And we go into that in, in great detail. It gives you tools and it gives you some real life examples like Anna that you're gonna hear from uh, about what this is like. But what, it, what is impact investing? I think the key thing is that it's intentionality around seeking to contribute to, to solving problems that have social and environmental challenges. Uh, there's a lot of people who are starting to do a bit of impact washing, but if you've got that intentionality, that, that certainly helps. There's a high expectation these days of a financial return. It can be different types of capital. It can be equity, which is what we're focused on. It can be debt, and there are some you know, other things as well. It can be um, catalytical um, philanthropy as well. But it also has to have a commitment, if you're into impact investment, a commitment to measure and report the social and environmental performance. You know, what is actually happening? So this is a really good snapshot. It comes from Bridgespan in, in the US. And if you look along the top, it's along the, um, the vertical axis. Um, it's, you know, what sort of returns do you want? Are you expecting to lose your capital or make nothing? Which is traditional philanthropy, which you can see at the bottom. Um, or do you expect a, a top market rate where a lot of, you know, motivated investments, you know, have been, they want the best. Um, we've then had social responsible investment and that's like a more passive approach to impact. And it's sort of had variations in terms of the type of return. But more and more, we're going to this right hand, I don't know what it's, uh, your right hand top bit of that we want evidence-based impact investments that have really good returns, are intentional, and that's where we sit in sort of this whole hybrid of returns. So that sort of just sets the pace. And then we sort of say, well, okay, who are the investors? And what can I expect as a profit for purpose business raising capital? There's a lot of things that are new, um, especially when you're just starting to put a company together. It's usually the first time. Um, the first is that your stake in the company, you know, may get very diluted. And do you want to make that decision or do you want to just hold on tight? And holding on tight is fine. Um, taking a lot of time. This takes an enormous amount of time and people expect that they might do it on a Friday afternoon. It's, it doesn't happen that way. Raising dollars from investment, investors cost dollars. So you've got to work out how you're going to afford that. Um, also, you're competing for funds. Investors who are looking to invest in different organisations have got different interests. So how do you align to those investors? How do you research those investors? Um, you're not the only one who's knocking on their door. Uh, how do you exit? Um, this is something that you don't really think about when you're starting. Um, you think, okay, I'm just going to um, do really well and I'll work that out later. It really is important to think of what the steps might be. Who might buy you if you want to exit? Do you want to stay in this for a long time? Do you want an IPO, which we'll talk about? Um, showing what your revenue increases are and as much evidence base about that and the growth around that. That's what uh, people really want to know. Being strategic about this capital, you know, where's it coming from? Is it the right capital? Is it at the right time? As I've said, researching investors and seeking uh, advice. Um, we refer people to um, investment readiness um, providers, and this is in the um, playbook details and um, some of them. And we've got some on the call now. Um, you, you know, they've done this before, so they can take you through the different steps. Um, 
some of the things we heard and, and the stories there, there's Rob Peacoon and there's James Bartell and you've got Anna Live, which is fantastic. But they've all got stories of what it's like to, to take impact investing. Uh, Robert says, we learned that relationships and finding aligned investors was critical. Uh, James said that impact investors who believed enough in the right things, that this impact um, you know, allowed them to create the impact that they wanted to create versus you know, other investors who might want something different or just financially focused. Um, again, my technical skills here. Okay, right. So in the playbook, what we've done is we've actually spent a lot of time going through the different types of funding and outlining those types of funding, the stages at which um, they're gonna be helpful, what you have to look out for, and really, you know, how you might step through this process. There's a lot more we could have said in the playbook, but we've, you know, we've focused on this because these are the questions we were getting all the time. Um, what I've done, what I'll do now is just give you some highlights. And Camille, you might, I don't know whether we can share two screens at once, can we? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, maybe, we'll try. But um, I'll wave the playbook at you. That, that's almost as exciting. Um, but for each of them, We've got a whole, that's not going to work. We've got a whole, but you know, detail of each of these types of funding. Um, if you've got family and friends right at the very beginning and you have multiple individuals who are involved because they're helping you out, they're putting $5,000 in, they're, you know, like just making you get you going, which is a really first step. You've got to be really careful about what structure you end up with and whether they're shareholders and what, what their rights will be. It can become really messy down the road doesn't have to be messy, but it can. Grants, as you probably already already know, is quite difficult for profit for purpose. Advanced Queensland has been doing a great job of putting out grants and they're fantastic, but there aren't many and they're quite focused on specific areas. Angels, I'm part of the Angel Network. We have a great network in Brisbane, which is really good and it's also part of the Angel Loop, which means that other angels around Australia will co-invest, which is a great opportunity. And you can, you can pretty easily get into presenting it um, at the Angels if you follow you know, some specific criteria. Um, and we've got a meeting tonight with some great, great ventures. Um, accelerators, you know, there can be very lucrative, can be um, really good, but again, they're quite focused around specific areas and specific areas of expertise. So you need to sort of check out whether this is going to help you and it's worth giving up X percent of equity for your role in the accelerators. The venture capital funds, you know, more and more we're getting um, impact oriented venture capital funds, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, but they will want very, very detailed due diligence of what you're doing. So you have to be prepared for them um, asking this information. And if you haven't got it ready, they'll walk away. And that's the same with investment funds. Um, it's very time consuming to be involved with those funds and you, know, you, you run a risk of, of wasting your time. Equity crowdfunding has got a lot of legal stuff involved in it. It sounds pretty easy, but it's quite complicated um, in terms of all the legal stuff you've got to get ready. And then if you really wanted to go for initial public offering, that takes quite a long time, is incredibly expensive, but you know, is that your exit? So what we've done is like outlined all those different possibilities of capital and giving you this playbook that you can sort of walk through, well, where am I, what am I doing? I just wanted to say thank you to nothing is individual um, to the people and partners. Uh, the English Family Foundation have supported Impact Queensland for our whole three years and they have been amazing and they've been providing the catalytic philanthropy so that impact investing ecosystem um, grows and we get more investment into this market. And I think I, think I saw Alan on the um, list um, in terms of the current people, so it's fantastic. Thank you to Alan um, and Tessa and to Belinda. They've been amazing. And um, we started at QUT Blue Box. We came out of Blue Box. Um, they were a great group and I have to give thanks to them. The Office of the Queensland Chief Entrepreneurs has been supporting us and we have a scrum task force every month or six weeks. And if anybody wants to be involved, just let us know. Uh, Jay at Social Change Central, which is in um, Sydney, amazing they put up lots of stuff about impact investing so get on their website anyway but he's um, done all the beautiful artwork not this powerpoint that was mine it's terrible but of the playbook which is beautiful 
Um, the writers of this um, are Jemima Walsh, Megan Owen and, and Harrod Lovick, and they put in a huge effort, so I want to really thank them. Uh, the impact team behind the scenes, uh, I've got Anthony, who's been involved in investment readiness and runs his separate business. Susan Black is now part of our team, our general manager, Alex McDonald and JC Bird, who's just starting, and Camille, so thank you, Camille. Just a minute. Um, and yeah, as I've said, the Impact Fund will start um, in, will launch officially in March, but, but uh, we want you to be investor ready and we're happy to take inquiries from November. So info at Impact Queensland, it's on the playbook that you'll get, the playbook's available there. Um, and so I wanted to hand over to Anna. We loved refugee talent from the beginning. It solved, it solved huge problems. It's the 70 million displaced people around the world. And here was a person in Brisbane and a person in Sydney who got together and started solving this. So they took on a significant problem. They have done right from the beginning, continuous innovation. They've changed and changed as they need to. They've secured um, contracts in all sorts of places, which is incredibly impressive, but they're breaking ground, particularly in social procurement, both here in Australia, but overseas. And I just think, I continue to think they're amazing. And it's time to hand over to the rock star, Anna Robson. Oh, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much, Lisa. Um, there is a quick uh, question in the chat about the launch of the fund. Just confirming it is March 2021. Yes, uh, but if you yes. want to do inquiries to us um, from November, that would yes. be great. Yeah, they are We'd love to hear from you. A lot of entrepreneurs in yeah. the chat, there's more and more support in Queensland uh, for you. So make sure you um, join the key hub. Um, so that's the Queensland Entrepreneurs Hub, uh, a really great resource and also uh, get in touch with Impact to be- Just email um, us at info at impactqueensland.com.au. Yes, to be impact ready, absolutely. Look forward to it. Yeah, um, and just to remind everyone, the um, the playbook will be sent to you via email after this event, so you'll get to actually read um, the content. So now um, let's let's um, have a chat with Anna. Anna, thank you again for for joining us. Um, let's let's start with uh, refugee talent. Can you tell us a bit more about um, your mission and and what's what's behind um, this great idea? Sure, so I'll just um, take you back to how um, we started Refugee Talent. So uh, this is my co-founder, Narari, who really we started from his personal experience as a refugee coming to Australia and trying to find employment. So um, Narari had a master's in IT, 10 years experience, spoke perfect English. And when he arrived through the humanitarian program, uh, he went to seek uh, you know, our normal jobs platform to try get a job in Australia and just couldn't break through the job market you know, because of no local uh, work experience here in Australia, which yeah, obviously if you've just arrived from Syria, <laughs> uh, you, you will never have had a local experience here. So really, um, Narari is just one of many refugees who come to Australia to try to rebuild their, their life. Um, and we met at a hackathon called Tech Fugees in 2015. And I'd just finished working on Nauru in the detention center for Save the Children. And really my experience there, you know, seeing um, people locked up. Um, yeah, every time I, I talk about it, it's emotional because, you know, I just saw a waste of human life and people who just wanted to, you know, work and had all these skills and you were really powerless to do anything. So when I met Narari, at this uh, hackathon back in Australia, I saw even you made it to Australia as a refugee, you were locked up in a different way out of the job market. So we had this idea of building almost a SEEK for refugees. So uh, originally we were actually called Refugee Intern and focused on internships, but then we realized actually people just need a job. So we changed to uh, Refugee Talent shortly after that. Um, we expanded just to give you a short journey over the four years how we've evolved. Um, we also expanded to including migrants um, who were kind of facing those same barriers of arriving to Australia and then struggling to, to get a job through the normal channels. Um, so we've now worked with more than 600 companies across Australia who work with us directly um, giving employment opportunities and we then provide a recruitment service matching refugees and migrants uh, into jobs uh, nationally across Australia. 
Uh, along our journey, we also met Talent Beyond Boundaries. There are now 80 million refugees displaced uh, in this world who all have a skills, doctors, nurses, engineers, and are a source of talent that could be filling you know, skills gaps um, across Australia and other countries. So we partnered with them and through our platform, made visible the only place in the world that you could see resumes of refugees that are sitting in Jordan, Lebanon, you know, unable to work in their profession. And now for businesses in Australia, they have this extra talent source um, through our partnership to hire, you know, software developers or butchers or uh, any yeah, candidate through, through our um, international refugee recruitment program. Uh, we also have evolved uh, to being a social trader a certified organization uh, which through the social uh, procurement uh, framework in Australia, um, this has been really key to, to our success and sustainability. Um, we've also evolved to not just doing recruitment, but actually licensing our employment software to, to other refugee organisations to help them capture that CV data of refugees, as that was a real key problem, was that people weren't actually capturing that CV data and making it visible and getting people along that journey to being job ready um, and now we've evolved to a new solution in that through this social procurement framework particularly in Victoria it opened up new opportunities as a social enterprise so an organization there asked us uh, to build them this tech solution which enabled them to not only hire refugees and migrants but also people from Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander backgrounds disability and other talent groups and now through building that um, software it's actually um yeah it's our new main uh, product that we're um you know working with organizations to um to sell a license from us so it's kind of through that framework given us a new uh, business opportunity and also enabled us to scale our our impact beyond just refugees and migrants to to other groups now Thank you, Anna. What a beautiful mission. And uh, you're making a huge impact already. Um, that's very impressive. Um, can you tell us more um, about your collaboration with Impact Queensland? So we'll probably take a few steps back um, when yep. you needed um, support to grow your, your impact. Yep. Um, so I met Lisa a couple of years ago, actually at the Brisbane uh, Tech Fugees um, Hackathon. And yeah, when you're on this journey, you know, you're just driven by your, your mission and trying to make it work. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So <laughs> you need, you know, people along the way to help support you and connect you and, you know, raise investment to, to support your, your mission. So um, Lisa helped us, you know, when we were raising money for the second time, um, not only invest her, herself, but also connect us with larger um, investors and facilitate those, those connections. And, you know, without that, um, you know, I found investors talk to, you know, other investors and, you know, to kind of make sure you're credible and you are, you are. So, you know, um, having someone like Lisa, who's got 20 years experience, um, uh, in this space and yeah, able to get other investors on board to you know, raise the money that you need to, to have the impact that you want to, um, yeah, is really key to our success. And yeah, we value you know, Lisa and other people's support like that who are along this journey with us to, to build this new um, impact investing scene. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That's, that's great to hear. Um, I, would love, I would love to circle back to one point you just mentioned. So you yep. said our second uh, round. So I think yep. it's really important uh, for all entrepreneurs to understand what are the different steps. So yep. uh, like Lisa said, you don't go from zero to a million often. Yep. Um, so can you tell us about the small little investment steps that you took with your company? Yeah, and I think it depends how you start as well, because when, when we start our organization, we start from a hackathon and we think, what will our business model be? And we chose that profit for purpose model. Um, and, you know, I think if you're starting as well, you have to think, does the product or service, you know, do you get paid for that? So for a recruitment service, if you're providing skilled talent, you know, people pay for that service. Or if you're providing a technology product, people pay for that. So at the start, you have to look, will this, you know, sit more under maybe grants and non-for-profit or, you know, does your product service generally make money or could it possibly? Um, so I think that's important to, from the start, look at that. But so we chose, you know, from starting at that hackathon and looking at a business model, 
um, you know, the first year we, we sort of self uh, funded it or just started up. Um, you know, I was Uber driving at the time and through Uber driving met an investor <laughs> and who gave us office space and helped raise that first round. So really, you know, that was almost under the family friends type um, category because it was really just one investor who through his network then helped us raise an initial, initial round. Um, then from there, you know, we did an incubator program with the Difference Incubator, um, which we won, you know, a, a bit of prize money from that, which again helped you along the along the journey. We went for many grants, which were unsuccessful, being a profit for purpose um, organization. That's changed a little bit now, I think, as social enterprises become more established. Um, but yeah, it's definitely harder as a profit for purpose to access grants. Um, so yeah, in our second raise, um, we then, you know, I think you go to a next sort of level. So it was a bit more through established um, groups and, and, and investments. Um, and now as we head towards, I guess, the third raise, we're looking at more of that investment um, fund. That's great, thank you. And I love the, I, lo I love that you took all the steps from bootstrapping to <laughs> going through around. That's definitely the way. Sorry, Lisa, were you going to uh, jump And in? also, Anna, you know, you're working with TDI now on investment readiness. And I think that's a really interesting area if you wanted to just talk about that, which, you know, they're based in Melbourne, but they're helping you because you were with the incubator with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now as we, you know, the first round when you're family friends, it's probably not, yeah, you're not putting as many structures in place at that stage. But now as you get more, you know, sophisticated, you, you need to do, you know, a lot more legal documentation and, and those things. So it's quite nice. We did the Difference Incubator um, program four years ago and they helped us really, you know, you're just doing the, the concepts of governance and legal and things you're not really thinking about at the start. You're just thinking about getting people jobs, but you have to start putting those processes in place. So, you know, really at the start, they just introduce you through the incubator to those concepts. And now as we're getting, you know, investor ready again and more financial modeling and, um, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, we're working with them again. And, and obviously having done their incubator program years ago, um, they know us, you know, from, from many years as well. So um, it probably gives them a bit more uh, knowledge of our organization as well and, and where we've come. And, and in our book, in, in the playbook is um, the website for the um, Australian Government Impact Investment Readiness Grant, uh, which you guys are applying for and yep. is well worth everybody applying for at the right stage. Yeah. And, you know, something like this um, playbook, like really, you know, you kind of learn as you go through meeting people, all, all these things. But yeah, now, you know, if an entrepreneur comes to me and it's kind of, what are, what are the steps and where are you at? <laughs> you know, something like this guide can, you know, give you three, four years of knowledge in, in, in a document. So I think, yeah, these things are really useful to, to share with other um, entrepreneurs or investors looking to get in this space and what level they're, they're coming in at. Thank you, Anna. Um, I've, got, I've got another question for you. So impact-led entrepreneurs are kind of a special breed of entrepreneurs. So tell us more about how you did mobilize impact investors around your mission um, yep. and how has it been to work with them? Yep. Um, yeah, well, you know, as I said, I met that first in investor through Uber driving, <laughs> you know, and really, well, um, his name's Jason Lee and his background was, you know, human rights lawyer in The Hague. So he understood, um, you know, at the human level, what, what we were trying to do, but also was a businessman and could see the, the potential, um, you know, and as we raised money that, that first time, I mean, that first time, you know, you're probably a bit more like, I just need the money to start. <laughs> but, you know, as you're kind of progressing now, you see how valuable your investors can be to help grow the organization and introduce connections to grow the business or add, you know, extra expertise in technology or recruitment or governance, whatever it is. So I think as you, um, you know, grow as an organization, yeah, you really then look to um, your investors also not just you know for capital but how they can really live and breathe your your values and your organization and help it um you know scale and impact which is in everyone everyone's interest so yeah very, very interesting so yeah i feel like you engage with them on two levels so the impact and the business equally um and also you involve them in your business as partners almost yeah uh, 
yeah, that's, I think that's a great tip for every entrepreneur is looking for impact investors. So alignment in value, but also alignment in terms of business capacity. Yeah. Um, what are your tips for um, purpose-led companies? We have a few on this uh, webinar um, to be successful in their impact investment readiness journey. Yeah. Um, well, I would say the social procurement sector, you know, has been like a game changer for us, like in Victoria, the social procurement framework and the targets, you know, set down there have made Victorian departments um, and organizations that have to meet that framework really innovative about how they engage with, um, you know, social uh, enterprises or impact led organizations. So I would say that that, that uh, framework um, is a game changer for, you know, impact led organizations. And if you can, you know, tap into that market, you should, because Victoria now, Queensland, New South Wales are all making really big strides in, in that area from the government level. And even private companies like SAP are setting their own 5% um, target. And so that framework, that government framework is, uh, or corporate's own framework, uh, are, are a game changer for, for organisations like us to access um, opportunities. And even you might look at what else you might do. So through that framework, um, the Level Crossing, for example, asked us to build this random platform that we thought, well, we'll do that because that will help us stay sustainable and do what we normally do. And now has led us to a whole new product um, that, that we're now focused on and, and a new business opportunity. So sometimes, you know, it might lead you to where you weren't expecting, but then it might, you know, is a new business opportunity uh, for you. Mm. That, that's great, Anna. Um, what are your, um, I've got one more question and then we'll open it, open up the questions to the, to the audience because there are already a few for you, Anna. So, um, Let's wrap up with uh, asking you what is next for refugee talent and also uh, you know, a few, you know, impact led uh, investors in this um, on this webinar or people who want to help. So uh, how can we get involved? Sure. Uh, well, what's next for us? Um, we're just rebranding actually at the moment. So anyone with a good new name, let us know. Because <laughs> now this new platform that we have, which incorporates not just refugee migrants, but um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait and disability, we're coming up with a new umbrella name. Um, so we're kind of rebranding and raising capital for the third time. Um, expanding a little bit more into New Zealand. Um, so it's quite yeah, exciting. Um, in, on that side and then for impact um, investors um, yeah I would say yeah look more at you know what social enterprise impact orgs are out there to potentially fund because this this framework has now opened up more opportunities for us and the social procurement market I think at 600 billion is you know the price of goods and services uh, in Australia so, you know, 3% target, 5% target for social enterprise is, is a massive um, opportunity for us to, to access and, and scale our, our, our impact. Um, and then as a, as a person, you know, you can look every day where you buy your coffee. Are you giving to a company that, you know, can have further impact or where you buy your clothes? So, I mean, everyone can look at where you, where you spend your money and which orgs you spend your money and, and where that money goes and impacts. So I think we all now in this time are looking at which businesses we'd rather spend our money. And if they can have a social impact, then of course, why you wouldn't buy with that, um, that organization. Absolutely. I can agree with you. Um, thank you so much for answering all my questions. We have uh, now a few in the chat, so I will jump in and ask you questions from the audience. Sure. The first question is from Bailey. So um, she's asking, can I, um, how do you, sorry, Anna, help to reduce the bias from employers who would normally not consider people um, without a an Australian uh, experience or background? Um, the follow-up question is, as people um, with no local background there, a fact, sorry, um, Um, yeah, so essentially the question is, how do you go around this um, bias and help people find employment here without having a background in uh, Australia? Yeah, 
Well, really, we focus on their strengths. So it's not that they don't have local experience, they've got global experience, you know, they've worked in Syria, they worked in Lebanon. So um, these people bring global experience to your organization rather than looking at it, oh, they've got a lack of local experience. You know, we placed a girl, an engineer who, you know, um, did the Syrian runway, you know, and now she was working on Westgate Tunnel in, in Melbourne and the experience that she can bring to that organization is, is how, how, how we frame it with um, uh, employers or, you know, from a um, credentialing point of view, you know, as an engineer, maybe you're not Engineers Australia qualified yet, but now, you know, if you're in a large organisation, someone, someone else who is qualified can sign off on your work and that person work at a more, you know, graduate level uh, while they are getting that qualification. So there's sort of ways um, uh, around that. And what, what was the other question again, sorry? Um, I think I think that's that was it. Um, how to work around the the bias with employers on the employer's side? Yeah. Great. Okay. Next question. Um, <laughs> yes. So we have one which actually uh, I'm going to ask Lisa and Anna because uh, you can both answer this one. Um, being a social enterprise or profit for purpose company, how does this limit or attract investors who are looking for return on investment? Um, but their return on investment will potentially be limited by the social investment of their business, of the actual business. And how does this limit an exit plan, which is what some investors are looking for? So it's the the famous or infamous question around return on investment and impact. Can they live together? Do we have to give up one for the other? Lisa, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Paul. He's got a great business um, with his wife in Townsville about drones, she maps. It's fantastic. Um, in our playbook, it's a good um, segue to our playbook when you get it. Uh, our Leanne Camp, Queensland Chief Entrepreneur uh, quotes about that uh, we are collectively moving from shareholder value to stakeholder value. So how's all that value been created? Um, another answer, another way to look at it is if you, well, two things. If you don't look at stakeholder value, you won't create long-term value. But with the ROI and value, value is ROI and growth. So you'll get growth in your ROI if you're doing the right things. And the long-term sustainable businesses, uh, you know, the original impact investing businesses that are around and have been long-term um, have done it that way. So you might have short-term, maybe some lower ROIs, but not in the long-term. In the long-term, you'll have great ROIs. Um, and ROI shouldn't be the only measure anyway. And in terms of exit, yeah, that's a really important thing. And that's what we brought up in the playbook. Um, you know, are you going to, do you want to be bought by somebody and who do you want to be bought by? Do you want to be bought by, you know, Amazon or do you want to be bought by someone who's aligned with your specific values or do you want to go and IPO? They're the things that you need to think about. But in the future and right now, you know, impact investment has cut through this and um, investors are going, we want the impact investment and, and we want the financial group financial returns and we're going to get great growth because these are long-term sustainable businesses doing great things. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Anna, do you have comments on the question? Yeah, well, I feel as a social enterprise, as, as I come back to the social enterprise framework and, you know, we're sort of building that, that runway and, and market for us to, to be yeah. successful. Um, so really that's in its, you know, uh, Victoria is sort of well established, but the other states are now, are now growing. So us as a national or global organization can now access more opportunities and, and, you know, be, be more profitable. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, you have to have the market there to enable us and investment funds, you know, impact fund is, you know, one of the first impact funds in Queensland. So that kind of shows you the market's still early and we're kind of, you know, working and building um, towards that. So um, yeah, if the market conditions are there, I see no reason why, you know, we, we can't be profitable and, and, and achieving social impact and returns uh, for investors. Thank you, Anna, that, that's great. Um, there's a lot of questions coming through the chat. Um, I'm going to ask you one on the behalf of Sarah. So Sarah says, love all the insight. 
Um, what are the legal implications you both think is important to consider? Should you hire a good lawyer early on to provide guidance? Um, and do you recommend any good le legal resources? Sure. Yeah, I think we had, you know, we've had a lot of pro bono support um, through the years. So some mums are only doing incubator programs or, um, you know, um, one of our investors board members was from legal background. Um, and, you know, I think as you go along the journey, sometimes, yeah, you're paying then for legal services. So I think if you can get some pro, pro bono help, like I think Justice Connect is one that connects you up with lots of law firms that offer pro bono uh, services. Um, but yeah, it really depends on, on yeah, what it is you want done. And sometimes then it's worth um, yeah, obviously paying for that service or if you can get pro bono, then um, yeah, can take that option. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think the response is, yes, you do need legal help. Um, how you get it and what you have to pay will depend, but there are great organisations in Brisbane, you know, giving great advice and some low cost. And I'm happy, if you want to contact me, I'm happy to give you some recommendations. Thank you both for that uh, answer. Yeah, legal is so important and can be a bit overwhelming for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, we have a question on pitching. And uh, I think, again, uh, it's going to be great to get Lisa and Anna's perspective. So Kate asks, um, I'd love to hear any comments or findings you might be able to share from the playbook about how impact-oriented pitches to angel and VC investors can be best designed and or delivered. Are there any key differences from more traditional investment pitches focused focus pr primar primar primarily sorry, on financial return prospects? Yeah, um, big difference is your impact measurement and showing what you're doing and doing a theory of change and showing what your framework is for measurement ongoing and, and what those measures are. Because if you can present to somebody that you've got business A with this financial return, but you've got business B with the same financial return, but all of this incredible social or environmental impact, then you're, you're on a winner. So I think that's the big difference. I think also just, um, hello Kate, it's great to see you. Um, also it's, um, I think it's a cognizance of that you actually have to go through this stuff. Like just because you're a profit for purpose or you're a social enterprise doesn't mean you can not do this stuff. You have to do the types of things that venture capital um, companies want. So you've got to be prepared and you've got to have it, you know, you've got to be ready for a data room. You've got to have everything, you know, set up. You can't think that you're going to get away with not doing very much. Yeah, and I think it depends on, you know, what, what investors you're pitching to. So, yeah, for us, we want investors that, you know, align with what we do that don't don't just want, you know, a uh, million dollars, you know, in, in, in returns actually to want to deliver social impact too. But of course, we want a, a return as well. So I think you have to look at the room that you're pitching to and are they the people that you really want in your organisation um, as, as investors. And I might just... Um, share my screen here because I forgot to share that slide but you know our social impact for example is yes direct job placements and through our tech you know making thousands more more visible to employers but also establishing a new visa pathway for skilled refugees in Australia with our partner Talent Beyond Boundaries and I mean, do you put a price on that? How, how do you say, you know, that, that visa is worth X number of dollars, but to be able to say as an investor, hey, we made this direct impact, but built a new visa system. I mean, you know, um, that's the balance of, yes, you want uh, profit and returns and, and then social impact um, that you can't necessarily quantify that <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I think um, the other thing that we always look for is the intentionality. So what's the what's the intentionality of this? Is it, oh, I've got a great business and by the way, I'll give away 5% to the poor? Or am I have I got a core intentionality that's solving one of the United Nations um, SDGs? So we look for that and that's not in, as Kate says, you know, what would be different? Well, that'd be different in an impact orientated pack. Thank you. Yeah. So the difference between, you know, impact as an accident versus really embedded yeah. in the business yeah. model. Yeah. And, um, and Anna, I love that you 
give us an example of your company because we can see that yes some are really measurable so i think you said 150 um, persons place that's tangible easy to count and some are um, a lot um, a lot harder to quantify but it's it's also uh, what's so fascinating about the impact it's it's complex yeah, I give you a small extra example too. Last um, the other week, our partners Talent Beyond Boundaries moved a family at this time, got him out from Jordan to Canada. You know, and and the primary applicant got a job, but also his you know wife and kids now moved to Canada, and now his daughter can eat for the first time. She wasn't eating in Jordan. You know what? <laughs> that is social impact now. His daughter eating properly and growing as well. So yes, we we made one direct placement, but you know, then you have this ripple effect um, as well. So, you know, we want investors or as a social enterprise and, and, and talking to investors, I want investors who also care about, about that, not just we made that one, one placement. Mm, thank you. I've got um, a question from the audience about um, the structure of a business and whether or not it's going to impact their capacity to attract uh, capital. I think that's a really good question. So Gloria is asking, um, is saying rather, we have both profitable fee for services and cross subsidies and potential for grants to provide services to disadvantaged communities. Would a NFP setup limit our ability to access social investor capital? Um, the big thing is like, what's the capital you want to access? So, you know, it's sort of obvious, but sometimes it's not obvious. If you're not for profit, you can't go for equity. Equity is a really good source because um, you don't have to pay it back. Um, it's available, you can access it. Um, so that's one of the things. The only other things that are available are debt and loans or grants. So, and crowdfunding is now equity crowdfunding as well. So um, yeah, hopefully the laws will change. <laughs> And yeah, sometimes it's good to have, um, you know, maybe a for profit organization and non for profit. So with our partners, um, Talent Beyond Boundaries, there are non for profits, um, because there's so much extra work. And again, until you have that, that runway until we have a visa set up for a business to hire internationally, it is not um, um, suitable to just charge a recruitment fee and char and cover the cost and time. So as we're kind of building this pathway of international refugee recruitment and, and making it um, just set up, um, you know, it's funded through philanthropy with, with Talent Beyond Boundaries. So through that avenue, we're able to then access more grants and uh, philanthropic groups. And then through Refugee Talent, our, our you know, domestic arm, uh, we're set up as a profit for purpose. So um, it could be good to set up potentially two, two different arms. Thank you, Anna. Interesting to learn about your, your structure. Um, I think each company needs to think about their own um, um, purpose and, and goals, right? Yeah. So uh, we've got a great question from uh, Cece, I guess, um, as a segue from your comment on um, the Impact Investment Readiness Grant. So Cece asks, are you aware of Queensland businesses that have successfully obtained the Impact Investment Readiness Grant? Yeah, um, there's not many, and um, I don't have a full um, understanding of it, but um, Anthony Owen, who's trying to get online, but he, he can't, uh, he's been successful at two. Um, social scaffolding, I think um, uh, somebody's online, Tari's on, online, Shari's online with that. Um, they've been successful in the past. There's, I think there's about four organisations here in Brisbane that do it, but there are um, Social Impact Hub who's got a lot. They're doing um, a, a, quite a few out of Sydney and they'd be more than happy to do it. Thank you. It's um, closing, sorry, and it is closing um, June next year. So we need to get them out and done. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are now reaching the end of this webinar. So if you have one last burning question, please type it in the chat straight away, uh, or I will have to wrap up. Um, although you can um, get in touch with Lisa and Anna, I'm sure outside of this webinar. Um, we have a um, we have just one uh, one comment on um, I guess the compatibility between the investor 
and um, the enterprise. So can you tell us more, both Lisa and Anna, how to go about finding that fit um, and that partnership? Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think that's why, well, that's why a fund is a lot easier. If you've got a fund, it's got some, you know, general investment strategies, which you're likely to fit, you can check it out beforehand. <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we're doing a fund rather than one-on-one, -on -one, you know, picking different investors and going to each of them. Um, I forget what the question was, but it's basically matching the values. You know, are you really interested in this business for the same reasons? Um, and how can we work closely with you? But that's hard work. And for us as a social enterprise, um, you know, now after four or five years, we've met, you know, people along the way that might be um, interested to, to invest. And now as we look to raise, we're looking for, you know, diverse in investors who represent uh, what we do and believe in what, what we do. Um, and as well, you know, working through a fund, uh, uh, that's a lot better as a social enterprise because as well, you know, it takes time to raise investment and, you know, to go meet lots of people individually is, is time consuming when you want to be building your, your organization. So, you know, having impact specific funds where the investors are aligned with, um, you know, uh, social enterprises, then um, yeah, this is better as a, as a entrepreneur. Thank you both Lisa and Anna. Unfortunately, that's all what we have uh, time for. Um, so, yeah, a huge thank, thank you for both of you to um, be here with us today. Um, I hope this webinar gave um, everyone practical knowledge of impact investing and will empower you to make um, positive decisions or to attract that juicy, wonderful impact capital to your enterprise. If you are an entrepreneur, make sure to connect with the impact team. They are absolute um, professionals in that space. Um, you have to work with them. If you are an employer, um, now you know all about refugee talent. So please think about Anna for your hiring needs. Um, um, I simply also wanted to close up by uh, saying that we have other webinars planned that will be super interesting. So make sure you register for our coming one, which will be on my absolute favorite topic, which is investing in clean tech and clean energy. It will be on September the 22nd. Um, and our guest speaker will be John O'Brien, partner at Deloitte. Um, he's a highly regarded specialist in energy transition and decarbonization. I am really, really excited to talk to him. Um, it's kind of a job perk when you host webinars, you get to speak to a lot of people you admire. So that's great. We are now 400 members and growing. I cannot believe it. That is so great. So if you enjoyed today, please invite friends and colleagues who might also find this conversation useful. Um, and make sure you follow us on social media to find out about our next events. Um, and finally, I would love to thank you all for coming today and making the time and commitment to learn and be curious. By learning and choosing to support impact investing and sustainable finance, we collectively can truly create and scale positive impact. So have a wonderful day, everyone, and uh, I will see you next time.